Jesus Christ, my living hope. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. Our God is ever.
Good morning, church, and happy Easter. It's a privilege to worship our risen Savior with you this morning. In the darkness we were waiting, without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes, to fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word, from a throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt. Welcome to Ironwood Church. Would you turn around and say happy Easter to someone and take a seat, please? Well, 
Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Easter. My name is Josh, and I'm the student's pastor here at Ironwood Church, and it is my honor to welcome you here on Easter morning. And so if it is your first time uh, here with us, thanks for joining us. Uh, You received a program on your way in, and in that program, there's a little connection card that if you would love to fill that out for us, we'd love to be able to get in touch with you, say thanks for coming, and see how we might get to know you, love you, bless you. Um, Now, whether you've been coming uh, to uh, Ironwood Church uh, for one week this week, or maybe for a few, uh, but you're curious, we've got two ways of getting connected over the next couple of weeks. So next week, we have this class called Start Here, which is a great way to kind of get to know us a little bit, kind of find your bearings, meet some people, and uh, get to know the church. And then in two weeks, we actually have uh, the Spring Carnival, which everyone is invited to on Sunday evening, and there's actually a little flyer in the seat back in front of you. You can take this with you as you leave today. It's got all the details on the back. Nice little reminder, toss it on the fridge. We'd love to have you come in a couple weeks and enjoy the Spring Carnival with us. Today we're going to be celebrating baptisms. And uh, baptism, yes, you can get excited about that. That's right, yes. And for those, uh, for those who are new or don't know, uh, baptism is this uh, wonderful sign uh, of an inward reality. That there has been this transformation that has happened inside of somebody who's put their faith in Christ. We're here this morning celebrating the miracle of Christ's resurrection. That Christ truly rose from the dead. And we believe that by the power of the Holy Spirit, God still brings about resurrection in the hearts and lives of people who are in need of his grace and and mercy. And so baptism pictures that. Pa- baptism pictures somebody going down into the waters, being buried with Christ in a death like his, and then rising up out of the water to walk in a newness of life with the new life that only he can give by his grace and mercy through faith in him. And so when we do baptisms after the sermon, we're going to have our uh, folks who are getting baptized, they're going to read their testimonies. And then when, uh, they're sing- when we're singing, they'll get baptized over here to my right, your left. And uh, we're going to cheer real loud because uh, we're cheering not just for them, but we're cheering for the work of God done in their life. And what I also want you to do is if you've been baptized, right, like as your pastor, as one of your pastors, if you've been baptized, I want you during this moment to remember your baptism, that your baptism points to your unity with Christ, your baptism points to that you have been made alive in Christ, your baptism that you watch them go through, but you remember yours, and in that moment you also are worshiping and giving thanks to what the Lord has done in your life, and we can just continue to give God glory and praise all morning long. Um, And so we'll do that after the sermon. But now we're going to turn our attention to the scriptures. And so there's a Bible uh, in the seats in front of you. You might have your own Bible. But we're going to be in Acts chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 27, and we'll go through verse 32. And once you've found it, if you would stand for the reading of God's word, if you are able... We'll read that. Acts chapter 5, verse 27 through 32. And here's the word of the Lord. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning and happy Easter, everybody. My name is Seth. I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and I get to teach this Easter morning. Uh, You know, I have a a little family. We're kind of fun. Uh, We like to hang out. People ask me, how's your weekend? I was like, it's the same as last weekend. A lot of little kid stuff. That's kind of how it goes. So that's my wife, Taylor. Been married about 10 years. 
My son Jay's four. My daughter Olivia is two. And we make a lot of errors as parents. Uh, some of them are unforced. Some of them are forced. They're errors. You know what I mean? And for example, recently we made a big mistake. We let our four-year-old watch the movie Monsters, Inc., which, those of you know about that movie, it's about the monsters in your closet, under your bed, that are there to scare you, that your parents don't believe in, but you know are there. And so it has caused some tension, it's caused some stress, and it's really revealed to me this point of tension, like for, for little kids, is differentiating between what is real and what is pretend takes a lot of work. It's pretty difficult. And we, as adults, oftentimes share in that difficulty, and especially growing up, trying to, being responsible to pass on a worldview to your children, trying to sort through, what if what I believe is real? What is pretend? You know, you grow up and you're told you can't swim for 30 minutes after you eat. Do I really believe that? No, no I don't. And so I'm, I'm, I'm throwing off the baggage my parents put on me and saying, we can go swimming immediately after we eat. That's totally fine. Do I really believe that you can't jump on the couch? Turns out, no, I don't, you know, and so we jump on the couch in our house, and it's getting beat up, but we'll worry about it later. But then you get to the point of talking about Christ, Resurrection Sunday, the Easter Bunny, what is real, what is pretend. And I think for a lot of people who grow up in the church, you grow up hearing Christ has died and risen, and at some point, you decide that is a children's story. That's not a true story. That's a pretend story. And sometimes we end up holding on to pieces of that story and believing it as though the resurrection is this metaphor meant to inspire a belief in second chances. That it's, it's a story of sometimes things don't go your way and guess what? You can turn it around. And it's just like any other Hallmark movie. You know, the guy was this way, but then he has a, a moment with his childhood sweetheart. And now he realizes I can go that way. And so the question I want to ask us this morning is, is the empty tomb of Jesus a children's story, a fairy tale, or is it a true story? Is it real? Did Jesus Christ really come to earth, die a sinner's death, stay dead for three days, and rise from the dead? Is there an empty tomb that he once occupied, or is that just a good story? And here's what I want to argue, and I want to challenge you all to think about today, is that we're going to zoom in on Peter's story, and I want to look especially at his transformation, his change. And I think his story shows us, Peter's change shows us that the resurrection is both true and it is useful. It's not just like calculus, true and not useful. It's true and it's useful, okay? So we're going to talk about its practical value. So look with me at John chapter 18. We see the story, and this is on the night that Jesus was betrayed. So Thursday in the story, Christ is killed on, on Friday. This is like Thursday night, Friday, early morning. Jesus has just been handed over to uh, the regime that he's going to get a false trial and eventually be crucified. And Peter has been following Jesus for a couple of years, thinking he's all in, being co courageous, being bold, or at least having sh believing he is courageous, believing he is bold. And then Jesus tells Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Peter goes, absolutely not. No, I won't. And then this story happens. Peter denies Jesus three times. John chapter 18, verse 16. So Jesus is going inside to, be, to, to deal with the trial. And it says, but Peter stood outside. He's already beginning to distance himself. He's already going, the momentum is shifting here on this Jesus revolution. The public favor that I felt like was swelling is now being squelched. He begins to distance himself. He takes a step back. Peter stood outside the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and, pe and brought Peter in. Verse 17. The servant girl. That could be translated this, like this tiny little girl. She's probably like 7 to 12 years old. She's at the door and tells Peter, asks Peter, you also are one of this man's disciples, are you? And Peter says, I am not. Whew. That's an embarrassing moment. You've got to understand here that these gospel accounts were written during the lifetime of Peter, during the lifetime of these eyewitnesses, during the lifetime of people. Peter would have to walk around town and be known as the guy who didn't have the guts to say, I'm following Jesus, to a little servant girl. Embarrassment, shame. Now the servants and officers have made charcoal fire. We skip down to other times Peter, Peter uh, 
denies Jesus. In chapter 18, verse 25, it says, Now Simon Peter is standing and warming himself. He's staying outside, keeping his hands warm in the fire. It's cold outside. And they said to him, You also are not one of the disciples, are you? And he denied it. said, I'm not. Then one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off. This is kind of an awkward moment, right? Didn't you like four hours ago cut off my cousin's ear? Which, that's how you know you're really bad with a sword. You cut an ear off. Like that, he wasn't going for the ear. He was going for the kill, and he just, bad with the sword. And the guy's going, I know it was dark outside, I know it was nighttime, but didn't you cut my cousin's ear? I don't know what you're talking about. He denies it. Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and once the rooster crowed. Peter, Peter is at an all-time low. Shame, embarrassment. I said I would die for Christ, never mind. Why? What's going on here? You fast forward a couple of months, probably not even a full year, but a couple of months to Acts chapter 5. Something has happened. Something has changed. There's been a a, a movement. It's kind of like you go back to your high school reunion 10, 20 years, and you go like, wow, what happened to that guy? Oof. Or hopefully the other way, like, oh, what happened to that guy? That guy, there's a change. You see change in someone's life. What What created the change? That's a good question to ask. What, what changed in Peter? Now, all of a sudden, the government, not little servant girls, but the, the government is saying, stop telling people Christ rose from the dead. And Peter says this, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging on the tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance and forgiveness of sins. What happened to Peter? This guy with no spine all of a sudden is telling the entire world system, pound sand, I'm not backing down. This guy who doesn't have the spine to confront a little servant girl and saying, yes, I'm following that man, I know him, all of a sudden, under threat of death by the government, is saying, you killed Jesus. What happened to him? Well, there's a couple of things Peter's transformation shows us. And again, we got to understand, these documents are written in the lifetime of the eyewitnesses. This is not just kind of cooked up and spit out 300 years later. In the lifetime of the eyewitnesses, these documents are written. Uh, one of the things we see uh, is how and why Peter changed is we learned that Peter was not willing to die for good advice. He's been following this Jesus guy around. He's a good moral teacher, excellent parables, confounding, teaches with authority, really inspires people to think about their own hypocrisy. And a lot of people nowadays think Jesus was a good moral teacher. Peter, maybe, when the momentum shifts, when the direction starts to move, starts to think like, maybe this guy's just a good teacher. And you know what I'm not going to get crucified for? A good teacher. The other thing we see in Peter's even rashness with the sword is that we we see that Peter's not willing to die for good politics. He's not willing to die for some failed political idealist. Jesus critiquing the Roman regime, critiquing the hypocrisy of the Jews who are in bed with the Roman establishment. And Peter gets his sword out thinking, we're going to take over this government. We're going to overthrow the evil ones. But then as soon as the momentum shifts and it looks like actually Jesus is maybe going to die, he goes, whoa, not willing to die for good politics. But then the Gospels teach us that Jesus dies and is buried and the disciples lose hope. They go and hide and then Christ appears to them and shows them the holes in his hands and he restores Peter. And something in Peter changes that when he sees the risen Christ, he goes from being a coward to being courageous because Peter is willing to die for good news. See, sometimes we think the gospel is good advice. Be a moral person. Stop doing those bad things. Stop doing that self-destructive behavior. I'm changed now. I'm doing better things. But it's actually a, a, a total misunderstanding of gospel. Gospel means good news. Peter's not willing to die for good teaching, not willing to die for good advice, not willing to die for good politics, not willing to die for political revolution, but he experiences the good news that Christ has risen from the dead, and now all of a sudden he's willing to die. Kill me if you have to. I'm not backing down. 
I think we are a lot like Peter in that we experience the shame and embarrassment of not even being who we say we want to be on a regular basis. If you want to follow Jesus, you experience the embarrassment of sin on probably an hourly but certainly a daily basis. I'm going to follow him, and then you waffle. Even if you're not a Christian, you know what it's like to have ideals, to believe you should be a certain way, and to experience the pain of not living up to your own standards. And we see this play out in Peter. The gospel is not just a children's story, not just a fairy tale, but it's good news that Jesus is inspiring in us and telling us is true, and Peter here is willing to die for that news. We see the transformation in Peter. So when you truly believe in the resurrection, when you truly believe Jesus rose from the dead, we see a handful of things play out in our life. Number one, you won't hesitate to give your whole life to him. Sometimes we try to hedge our bets and be one foot in, one foot out with Jesus. Sometimes we try to kind of say, yes, I'm for him, but I'm for all these other things, and I'm, I have this like mixed allegiance thing. But when you believe, really, that there is death and then there is resurrection, you go, if that guy can predict his death and resurrection, then whatever he says goes. I don't need to keep myself back from him. I don't need to protect myself from him. I don't need to be like a 60% follower. I want to be a 100% follower of Jesus. And so Peter stops trying to protect himself and starts actually being interested in living for Jesus. Number two, when you truly believe Jesus rose from the dead, you'll notice that the approval of your peers isn't as important as you thought it was. You know, growing up, one of the things my dad said on a regular basis was your friends are all dumber than you think they are. <laughs> and in high school, I thought, you know, easier said than done. But the older I get, the more I'm like, yeah, we're all kind of dumber than we think we are. But yet we're so preoccupied and concerned with the approval of crowds. When Peter sees the risen Christ, he goes, I don't care what a little servant girl thinks, and I certainly don't care what the emperor thinks. I care about what God thinks because he's the one who opens graves and conquers death. Some of us are slow to follow Jesus because we're concerned about public approval. But when you really believe Jesus rose from the dead, you'll see that's not that important. Third, when you believe Jesus rose from the dead, you'll be less anxious about death. Because this part of your life is just a part, a blip on your eternal life. Sometimes we're so anxious about keeping ourselves alive because we think this is all I got. Maybe Peter's thinking this is the end. I don't want to tell the servant girl I was following Jesus because I might get killed like him. But then at the end of Peter's life, he's telling people, I believe Christ rose from the dead. And guess what? He is killed like him. Peter gets crucified for saying Jesus rose from the dead. Why? Because if there's life after death for Jesus, then I can take seriously Jesus' teaching that there's life after death for me. I'm going to a baseball game on Wednesday. Nine innings of mostly semi-entertaining action. <laughs> it's America's pastime because it takes a lot of time. You know, that's the... Your life, this side of your death, is like one pitch in nine innings over 162 games, which is way too many games. <laughs> but your life, this side of your death, is just a blip on your life. It's one pitch. That's all it is. And so we don't have to focus on being hyper-protective of this life because we believe that there is eternity, that there is life after death. And so Peter says this, leader and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Repentance does not mean going from being immoral to being moral. Repentance means a change of mind, a change of thinking. I'm going from allowing the world to define my reality to allowing God to define my reality. My mindset is shifting. In one hand, that takes an instant. Jesus is king, I am not. On the other hand, it takes a whole lifetime to really wrap your mind around what does it mean to let God define reality and forgiveness of sins. This is the offensive part of this, st this statement. You killed him. You killed Jesus by hanging him on a tree. 
When you see Christ crucified, we shouldn't just think those bad people killed Jesus. We should think my sin contributed to the death of Jesus. And Christ risen is willing to offer us forgiveness and repentance no matter how our life has gone this far. And so my prayer for us today, this Resurrection Sunday, is that we would not think Christ crucified and risen is just a fairy tale. We would not think it's just a children's story. We would not think it's a bunch of good advice about being a moral person, but we'd believe it is true and that it is useful. And then we'd put it on our hearts, we'd pass it on to our children and their children and their children and their children because Christ truly died and Christ is truly risen. Let me pray. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will awaken us. That maybe for the first time this morning, some people would stop believing the resurrection of Jesus is just a children's story, and they would start believing that it is a true story, and I pray that your Spirit would help us believe. God, as we celebrate these baptisms, I pray that we'd hear ourselves and see ourselves in these stories, and I ask that you would give us the courage and the faith of Peter, who in believing Christ is risen, was truly changed. In your name we pray, amen. We're now going to pivot and take some time to listen to people's stories before they get baptized. So let's pray for them as they share, and let's let our hearts be open as we identify with them. I'm Mark. And this is Aiden, who will be baptized by his dad, Brandon. Here's his story. Without Jesus, my life has been marked by stress, which I tried to hide by playing video games and stress eating. God took a hold of my life through my family. I grew up in a Christian home and am curious about many things. My dad and I talk a lot about God and my questions about the Bible. God has used my family, this church, and my youth group to draw me closer to faith in Christ. Jesus is my treasure because he loves me even when I mess up. He is always faithful even when I am not. Jesus is changing my life by making me more disciplined as I read my Bible and by helping me be more kind to difficult people. I want to be baptized because I would like to declare publicly that I am a follower of Christ. Hi, my name is Jordan. This is my stepdad, Scott, who will be baptizing me today. Without Jesus, my life has been marked by idols, adultery, lust, sin, substance abuse, anxiety, depression, purposeless, and hopelessness. I lived a double-crossed life. I, don't, I knew how to fit in a church, but then my life is completely different in the world. I was spending my life searching for fame, money, girls, and I was incredibly empty. I'd search for motivation and try to use my negativity and traumatic past to energize my self-improvement efforts, but it was actually, it literally wasn't helping me. God took a hold of my life through my stepdad, my mom, my grandmothers, my stepbrothers and sisters, my mentors, and my friends. Jesus is my treasure because he made the ultimate sacrifice for me so that I could have a life again and be a child of God, something that I once subconsciously thought I had to earn, but I know now that's not how grace works. Jesus has changed my life by showing me that walking with him gives me a purpose and lets me save others through him so they don't have to go through what I did. Finding a group here in young adults is helping my growth. Lately, I've been memorizing parts of the Bible, which really helps me stay close to Jesus as well. I want to be baptized because this is the next step in my faith to be with Jesus and as a disciple through God as he works through me. Thank you. My name is Scott, and this is my son, Ryan, who I'm going to baptize today. Here's his story. Without Jesus, my life has been marked by anger and sin without regard. 
I would do something wrong that I knew was wrong in my heart, but I didn't care about the consequences or how I could have hurt someone. It got worse after my mom passed away when I was eight. I was angry with God for not saving her like I had prayed for. I was at rock bottom and turned to addiction and evil instead of the church that I grew up in. This way of life was never fulfilling and always led to more anger and sadness. God took hold of my life through my dad and my church mentors. I'd always heard about God's plan and how everything had a purpose, which I didn't understand how losing my mom could be a part of that plan. During my freshman year, I saw how everything worked out. So many things have happened in my life for the better that wouldn't have happened without my mom's passing. So I trust in God's plan. One Wednesday night in 23, my mentor Andrew explained how everyone is either moving towards or away from Jesus. I told my mentors that maybe I wasn't moving at all. But Andrew told me that you can't be not moving in one way or the other, and I realized that I was moving away from Jesus. I met my mentors for breakfast, and that's when I gave my life to Christ. After that, I wanted to get baptized, but I felt I needed to fix myself. So for about a year, I tried and failed. Then at winter camp in 24, Seth was preaching and said, don't try to fix yourself and then go to Christ, but go to Christ and let him fix you. And I really started thinking about getting baptized and how I don't have to fix myself after all. Jesus is my treasure because I have, given, I have been given a better life full of joy through him. Now that I have the peace of Christ, I no longer feel those same emotions of sadness and anger. Jesus is changing my life by giving me a conscience to see how my actions affect others, making me rethink and eventually stop doing those things. Through Jesus, I've dropped many bad habits and started making better ones. Living this new life in Christ has given me a better outlook, and I'm happier. Although I will never be perfect and will make many mistakes, I know that Jesus is my Savior and that he is good. I want to be baptized because I want to live a better life in Christ. I want to have a reminder of why I'm living my life for Christ and to celebrate leaving my old life behind and coming out of the water anew. In the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of light, forever under your dominion, you're the king of my life, you're the king of my life. You reign above it all, you reign above it all, over the There is no higher name, Jesus, you reign above it all. On the cross, the work was finished. God, you poured out your life just to give us new life. Now from the lips of the forgiven, Hear an anthem arise, Jesus, you're alive, oh, you reign above it all, you reign above it all, over the universe and over every arm, there is no higher name, Jesus, you reign. darkness run out of an empty grave now seated alone in glory enthroned on the highest praise you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave 
Now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running out of an Hi, and this is my friend Elliot, who's baptizing me today, and this is my story. While I was raised in the church, even baptized as an infant, it all just felt like something I was supposed to do, checking a box to make my family happy. For a long time, I lived a bit of a double life. Church tie acted nothing like school tie. I became a real-life Harvey Dent of sorts. Sure, I served a lot of church in the past, but I did it because it was fun for me. I learned how to play pharisaical games with people, masquerading as the nice little Christian boy who made folks smile when he made quite a racket on the drums. Meanwhile, my selfish, addictive behavior was slowly eating away at my heart and my mind, driving me in circles emotionally. This made me question my faith on several occasions and even resort to self-destructive behavior. God took a hold of my life through the community surrounding the young adults ministry and my friend Elliot, who came alongside me. I'm so grateful for all these people that God put in my life who consistently pushed me to be better. Jesus is my treasure because I love that he doesn't exclude any group of people from his promise. Salvation is a free gift extended joyfully to all who believe him to be their Lord and Savior, no matter what disgusting things they've done. Jesus is changing my life by rewiring my mind and refocusing my habits to be more constructive to further his kingdom. I want to be baptized because I want to declare that I am a child of God, be obedient to him, and I'm ready to keep moving forward. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sam, and I have the privilege of baptizing Carlos today. Here's his story. Without Jesus, my life has been marked by pride. I was prideful and thought that I didn't need Jesus. I thought I could do everything on my own and that my success was a tribute to myself rather, rather than God. God took a hold of my life through FCA. I met Jeremy Slather, Sather, who taught me about who I play for in sports and the importance of leading a team with compassion and kindness not with pride and ignorance. Finally, God got a hold of my life when I broke my back. I was on the highest of highs, ego through the roof, when all of a sudden I injured my lower spine and that would take me out of the majority of the season. This sucked as you can imagine, but I feel I've never felt closer to God. FCA taught me who I was, who I play for, and that I never have been more grateful for the opportunity to play for, to play again, to play for God. Jesus is my treasure because even though I denied him and pushed him out of my life, he always came back to me with open arms and forgiveness. Jesus has changed my life by showing me that I cannot do anything on my own 
and that I can do all things through him. He has taught me to be a better person and how to love people who are hard to love. I want to be baptized because I want to share with everyone that I'm a Christian and a child of God. And I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Hi, my name is Brady, and this is Mark, who will be baptizing me today. Here's my story. Without Jesus, my life has been marked by chaos. I lost my way in the world and in my youth. Pride and anger drove me away from God. I began to worship myself, and this indulgence in myself led me to addiction. God took a, a hold of my life through almost losing another job due to alcoholism. My marriage was on the rocks because of the same. My boss called me into his office, as an office and offered me help. He offered me an opportunity to get sober and to see that God was there in my life. Jesus is my treasure because I know that Jesus has been by my side my whole life, guiding me to a place of submission and understanding. Despite the wrongs I've done in my life, I serve a God of forgiveness. Jesus has changed my life by giving, by giving me life. Today, I can say I'm sober because of the changes God has brought in, uh, brought into my life. Because of the acceptance of God back into my life, my relationships with my wife, children, and family have begun to mend. I want to be baptized today because I want to demonstrate my commitment to the Lord. I want to be a role model to my family of what a good Christian man looks like. I want to walk in obedience of Jesus. He did, he did, who paid for all of us. 
Happy Easter, everybody. So thankful that you uh, got to observe the holiday with us this way. If you would like to become a Christian and follow after him and take that first step, we'll have a prayer team in the back left of the room who would love to help you go to Christ in repentance and in faith looking for forgiveness of sin. Uh, One thing that's unique about today besides it being Resurrection Sunday is everything that is given today to our church we are giving away through our benevolence account. And so our benevolence account exists as a way of supporting people who are going through financial uh, or or especially like difficult situations. A lot of uh, single moms, a lot of people going through abuse or divorce, things like that. This is one of the ways that we support and fund people who are going through a really hard time. And so if you want to give today, Everything that you give today will go to the Benevolence account. You can give online by doing that QR code, or everything you put in the boxes on the way out uh, will go to that. So if you'd like to give, please go ahead and do that. Um, And before we go, we're going to do a benediction here, but you're going to get a little participation here. So uh, in church history, a really common thing on Resurrection Sunday is the leader would say, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. All right, that was really good for a practice round. Now we're going to do it for real, all right? He is risen. He is risen. Love you all. Happy Easter. Have a great rest of your day.